period where there was another, what at the time looked like a big data revolution in um, kind of anthropology and sociology. Um, a particular uh, case study that is interesting in reflecting on the ways in which anthropology and sociology emerged as disciplines and some of the kind of challenges that, that um, uh, emerged at the time out of studying particular kinds of data and um, f think through some of the kind of implications of that for the, the kind of current uh, data revolution uh, and uh, the ways in which it might transform heritage research uh, for us now and the present. Um, so I think each of the three papers in the morning session raise questions of the relationship between collective and individual beliefs, actions and knowledge practices, both from the outside in the sense in which uh, as researchers we may be interested in developing new techniques for investigating what people say and do and understanding how this reflects on what people value, but also from the inside in the sense in which these uh, various social media represent uh, liberal governmental technologies or techniques of self-fashioning and by that I mean technologies that are equally concerned with making and remaking individuals and collectives as part of complicated iterative feedback loops uh, and, and they're as concerned with that set of processes um, that set of processes of making and refashioning individuals and collectives as they are with simply reflecting them so they're just they're not just a picture but they're kind of active, active parts and machinery of these processes of, uh, of fashioning and refashioning individual and social collectives. So I want to put some of these concerns within a broader historical context and draw on what I think might be some helpful analogues from the history of anthropology and sociology as part of a, um, a broader piece of collaborative research that I was involved in which looked to develop a comparative history of museum anthropology across the United States, UK, France, Australia and the Pacific in the 20th century. And this project looked particularly at the shift from race to culture as a governing uh, what we term transactional reality, drawing on um, Foucault's work, for understanding how differences within collections and by extension differences within human populations should be collected and ordered and how these ways of understanding difference might be deployed through targeted practices of social government. And as part of this project, which culminated in the jointly authored monograph Collecting, Ordering, Governing, one of the things that I worked on particularly was the Mass Observation Project, an early attempt to use social media in the form of the postal service to both understand and shape individual and collective human sentiment and will before, during and after the Second World War in Britain. And so we tend to think of the current interest in citizen science and big data research within heritage and museums as relatively new, but I want to look on this earlier history of attempts to collect, reflect on, and understand collective sentiment, what, what mass observation referred to as morale, in the light of some of the issues which the paper in the morning session raised, which ask similar questions. So mass observation was founded in 1937 in the immediate wake of the uh, Edward VIII abdication crisis, when anthropologist and amateur ornithographer Tom Harrison, recently returned from fieldwork in Borneo and Vanuatu, responded to a letter published in the left-leaning periodical New Statesman and Nation by poet and subsequently sociologist Charles Madge, which announced the establishment of the Blackheath Group concerned with developing an anthropology at home uh, to help understand the reaction of the public to this and similar contemporary events. The Blackheath Group included a number of individuals, including Mass Observation co-founder, poet and documentary filmmaker Humphrey Jennings uh, and photographer Humphrey Spender, who'd been involved in, in organising the first London International Surrealist Exhibition in 1936, and their approach was strongly influenced by surrealism and notions of the collective unconscious. Harrison, who'd begun working in 1936 in the north of England in a factory in Bolton as an exercise in what he termed the participant observation of England's natives, combined his anthropological fieldwork practices with the more artistic and journalistic methods of Madge and Jennings, and the foundation of mass observation was reported in the same periodical briefly afterwards. And mass observation quickly proceeded along two fronts. Harrison initially developed and directed the Worktown Project and the Sea Town Project, which were operated out of a house rented by Harrison for this purpose in Davenport Street in Bolton. This project involved forms of relatively covert observation undertaken by a small number of individuals, generally around about a dozen, although sometimes up to 60 uh, observers um, 
And these were paid and sometimes volunteer observers who observed others under Harrison's direction, keeping copies of notes and making detailed reports on their findings. So he would give everyone a kind of theme or a topic, send them out on a day, and they would come home and they would collect their thoughts. Meanwhile, the, uh, the National Panel of Part-Time Volunteer Observers was established and directed by Madge from his home in Blackheath in London. This national panel was composed of volunteers who initially agreed to keep a diary of all of their own activities and reflections on a single day, so these were referred to as day surveys, and subsequently to respond in writing to particular directives, such as this one here on the screen, which were queries sent out by the team of Blackheath, so a sort of a quest, proto questionnaire, I guess. The important distinction here is between the observation of others in the Worktown project and the observation of self in the national panel, although sometimes members of the national panel were also asked to interview colleagues and family members about particular issues and directives. And in the book, we place this within a much longer history of amateur anthropology, anthropological survey, most notably the uh, British Association for the Advancement of Science Ethnographic Survey of the United Kingdom and Notes and Queries on Anthropology. So members of the national panel were recruited through advertisements placed in magazines and newspapers, in particular the New Statesman and Nation, but also responded to radio programs, popular pamphlets and books, uh, which were published recounting the aims and preliminary findings of the organisation, which became a subject of national interest and frequent public comment as a result of widespread media coverage. So the size of the national panel quickly swelled to over 2,000 people as mass observation developed into a popular social movement in the months leading up to the outbreak of the Second World War. Following the outbreak of war, the fear of the disruption of the postal service forced mass observation to desist from sending regular directives, and national panel me members uh, were instead urged to get comprehensive diaries during this period, a task which almost 500 people undertook sporadically or continuously throughout the Second World War, and this produced this um, kind of amazing archive of these war diaries, which I, I haven't looked much at, um, but there's been quite a lot written about. Um, Mass observation took on a very important political role during this period when it initially publicly criticised government efforts to engender support for the war effort and subsequently it was commissioned by the Ministry of Information to provide in information about wartime morale and, and ultimately became an actual instrument of, of uh, wartime government. So conflict between the various founders saw Jennings Park Company with Madge and Harrison in 1938 to concentrate on filmmaking for the General Post Office Film Unit which in 1940 became the Crown Film Unit, also part of the Ministry of Information, and they made a number of um, uh, sort of wartime propaganda films. London Can Take It, very sort of uh, uh, in spirit, spirit raising kind of films. Um, Madge subsequently departed to undertake various research projects, including a study of wartime economics for the Institute of Economic and Social Research, and, and subsequently took up the first chair of sociology at University of Birmingham in 1950. And mass observation was subsequently wound down in 1950. Um, it had increasingly become a kind of market research organisation. It was wound down and then started up again in the 1980s and is still active today. So um, let's jump forward a little bit. Post-Truth was named as the International Word of the Year by the Oxford English Dictionary in 2016, defined as relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. And the editor said the use of this term had increased by around 2,000% in 2016 compared to the previous year. Spiking usage, it said, occurred in the context of the EU referendum in the United Kingdom and the presidential election in the United States. So mass observation was founded in 1937 in the midst of the, another post-truth crisis, if not in name, then certainly in sharing a similar set of concerns with the relationship between collective sentiment and what would become known as morale or knowledge and truth. In February 1937, mass observation wrote, as a result of the abdication crisis, we realised as never before the sway of superstition in the midst of science, how little we know of our next door neighbour and his habits, of conditions of life and thought in another class or district our ignorance is complete. The anthropology of ourselves is still but a dream. But how might an examination of the collecting, ordering and governing practices associated with this Anthropology at Home project provide insights into the current political and intellectual crisis of post-truth and a more general reflection on some of the themes raised by the morning's papers? I think a consideration of what was perhaps most successful and probably most interesting in mass observation, which was an attempt to reshape collective knowledge practices and to bridge the gap which was perceived between 
the rulers and the ruled, the governed and the, and the government, by insisting on the transformat transformative and emancipatory potential of collectivized liberal practices of self-observation, self-reflection and self-knowledge might be helpful here. In mass observation, it was thought that these oligoptic practices would en masse help to develop liberal participatory forms of citizenship based on responsibilized freedoms and norms which were collectively generated. This was in turn based on a sophisticated conceptual understanding of the relationship between public and private and individual and collective sentiment between habit and thought which centered around the key concepts of mass and morale. So what was novel in mass observation, particularly in this early period, was the ways in which it combined the observation of the self and others with the process of collecting. So in this sense, it operated both as a technology of the self through its establishment of models of self-observation and diary writing, and as collective habit through its normalization of mass surveillance and opinion polling as popular pastime and social science. Um, it did this through this sort of feedback loop that it established between the directives which were sent out and the newsletters which it would send to participants which reported on the results of these uh, directives, but also gave guidelines on how um, mass observation would like the data to be organised so that it could be collected and, and um, better organised once it was returned to base. So we had this sort of very proto-Twitter-like feedback loop of um, questionnaire and response and then feedback <coughs> that kind of formed this sort of um, self-observing kind of loop. Um, so mass observation in initially sought to cultivate modes of self-reflection that opened up a space in the subject between unconscious, automatic, repetitive habit and conscious, reflective, deliberate conduct. Mass observation operated to construct a division in the self between habit and reflection as a form of self-regulation that worked via reflective freedoms to modify that which was habitual and automatic. And Tony Bennett has recently shown how the significance of this concept of habit relates to different accounts of its place relative to thought, will, instinct and memory within different historical conceptions of different architectures of the person, so um, different ways in which people and their bodies and their minds relate to one another. In this regard, mass observation was influenced by a broadly uh, Henri Bergsonian sense of personhood. So Bennett notes that for Bergson, the relationships between habit, memory and memory proper produce a space in which freedoms can be delimited and distributed so as to empower a certain kind of emancipatory practice of the self on the part of those who, who possess the inner partitioning of the person required for this purpose and to not deny it where such partitioning is absent. So what, what constitutes free will is a kind of a, a key set of interests here. The techniques used by mass observation for the collection and dissemination of data on the masses, it would seem, shared in this political logic of mobilising technologies of self-fashioning that operated on the premise that knowing oneself required knowing one's society, that is, through active participation as a gatherer and interpreter of social data, the volunteer observer was to be drawn into a better and ultimately emancipatory understanding of her or himself through an understanding of the mass society in which he or she was present. These functions became particularly important following the outbreak of war. And uh, mass observation uh, completed its first wartime report in uh, 1939, actually um, after it became very critical of the campaign that's now become very famous around Keep Calm and, and Carry On, which was one of three sets of advertisements that the Ministry of Information produced, uh, but was never actually used. It was immediately discarded and it was re rediscovered uh, <coughs> only about 10 or 15 years ago, but um, the other two were, were very uh, strongly criticised by mass observation based on their, uh, the data that they were collecting from their uh, respondents um, as part of the day surveys and also as part of their directive questions. Um, and it, um, it went on to deliver its final report in 1941. And this resulted in a new kind of application for these um, investigations of the organisations. It's various instruments that had in peacetime aimed to gather data on the habit, emotion and opinion of the masses were thus recomposed to become part of the Ministry of Information uh, and, the, and the work was directed at civilian morale. And in its investigations of morale, mass observations was at pains to draw um, a qualitative distinction between public and private opinion. A distinction it suggested was critical in the measurement and interpretation of morale. One report claimed 
In generalizations about morale, one must always bear in mind the vital difference between what people say, especially what they say to a stranger, and what they're thinking deep down. So here they develop this sort of methodological problematic, one which is based on a sort of broadly Freudian via archaeological understanding of the mind and how the mind works, of the sort of uh, the surfaces and the depths. So there's this idea that one needs to go below the surface to understand not just what people say, but also what they think and how we might use this to, importantly, how we might use this to predict how people might behave. So the good government of morale was thus the management and minimization of the dissonance between public and private opinion, between external and superficial public expression, and internal and deep private countenance, such that this sort of volatile pressure didn't explode in an uncontrolled manner, detrimental to the individual subject and the social order. And the lack of understanding and failure to grasp the disposition of ordinary citizens was seen as a kind of recurring and prominent accusation that was made in the mass observation documentation against the nation's political elites. The governors regularly chastised for the inadequate knowledge of the governed and thus their poor um, understanding of how to manage civilian morale. So um, mass observation's morale work reflects a persistent Br British anxiety related to class, social order and mass society. And we see echoes of this dystopian and, uh, in dystopian and post-apocalyptic film and literature throughout the 20th century. And here we've got a good example of this in uh, J.G. Ballard's 1935 novel, High Rise, which charts the social collapse of a utopian community in a high-rise build, com building complex in which social order is completely overturned by the anxieties and issues that uh, arise out of uh, close, proximal, high-density social life and, and the breakdown of uh, social norms, these liberal governmental practices that kind of make life in such collectives possible. Um, and we see these concerns continuing to be reflected in contemporary anxieties related to the ways in which web-based technologies and social media in particular might impact on people's behaviours, opinions, attitudes and beliefs on a massive scale, often without their awareness in uh, discussions around Twitter and Wikipedia and the like. And um, <laughs> the sorts of ang anxieties that arise around how this is manifested. And, and one is in the sort of uh, consistent inability to predict election and referendum results through traditional opinion polling and uh, media. So what interests me here is the ways in which attempts to manage and minimize the spread of misinformation and rumor, intentional or otherwise, continue to assume that the solution lies somewhere within the public sphere and to ra raise similar questions to mass observation in the relationship between individual and collective subjecti subjectivities on the one hand and the public and private mind on the other. So for example, Google uh, in 2015, 2016, proposed this variable for quantifying the quality of web sources and relaying this into its search results, this knowledge-based trust score, um, as, a, as a sort of answer to something like page rank or authority hub, which tended to just sort of aggregate, push things that were used a lot more to the top. Um, but it was still based on this assumption that objective truths would be present en masse within the public mind, the hive mind, and that this public, it was on this public mind that one must work to affect changes in the private mind and thus directly on collective subjectivity. Uh, however, much contemporary digital social media assumes a process in which the private is effectively turned inside out. So the private is made public, but in doing so, this would seem to falsely assume the distinction between individual and collective public and private subjectivity is straightforward in precisely the way that mass observation warned against. This inability to reflect on or develop additional instruments which might help to understand private opinion and the ways in which it interfaces with public opinion to generate what mass observation called morale seems to be a significant failing in contemporary debates about public knowledge and post-truth. And although many have suggested the death of privacy as, as a result of the ways in which people's lives are increasingly lived out in the public by way of social media, uh, it's clear that other more complicated aspects of collective mentality continue to play into such issues. So while Twitter, for example, represents an incredibly sophisticated, almost instantaneous extension of the kinds of feedback loops that were initiated in mass observations, practices of collective self-knowing, it nonetheless, nonetheless lacks other aspects of mass observations interests in the complicated relations of subjectivity, which helped articulate morale as an object of collecting and knowing and an interest in its good government through intervening in and managing the dissonance between public and private countenance. 
Um, so there's a connection here with Tony Bennett's recent work again on habit and the different models of habit which relate to individual, which um, ask us to begin to understand the difference between what constitutes individual habit and collective habit. Um, these arise from recent developments of the interfaces of governmentality and active network theory that also points to the need to take into account the organisation of capacities that are distributed across networks that include both persons and things, approaches which in turn might open up ways of thinking about and acting on habits that are not either solely the properties of individuals nor mere aggregates distributed across segmented <coughs> populations, but are instead parts of actionable moral orders constituted in the relations between human and non-human actors. So there's something which is fundamentally different. So in this sense, perhaps mass observation has something to tell us about the complexity of collective subjectivity, which is absent from contemporary debates relating to social media, post-truth and populations, and which touches more generally on the recent interest within museums and heritage, within crowdsourcing values and attempts to democratize their practices through forms of citizen science. The significant gap between techniques and methods for understanding individual and collective belief, sentiment and actions seems to me to be an important area for further development an issue which all three of this morning's papers reflect on in their own particular ways. And while these questions are only beginning to be addressed, I hope by placing them within a broader historical uh, context, but also within a sort of meta-disciplinary context, um, this provides some ways of thinking productively about the future of this area of research and some of its social and governmental implications. Uh, I don't think I need to see questions because I think it is time for lunch. So we'll, we'll um, but if anyone wants to talk to me about this, we can talk about it either in the next session or at lunchtime. Uh, and we'll come back at, we said we'd shift it through 15 minutes. So yeah, we'll come back at uh, 1.30. So thanks to all the speakers in the first session.